Welcome. Very excited. Very excited to have you here. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. How's France? Oh, perfect. <laughs> Magical. I remember Paris. <laughs> very different down here this is this is its own sort of it's its own world down here in the southwest it's very um it's such an amalgamation of different cultures right there's a lot of mediterranean culture down here and the, all of cather country was originally the kingdom of occitania so it it, it has this very sort of independent spirit down here and um they're just it's just salt of the earth people but for someone like me who uh is I am a daughter of the Middle Ages. I love all things from the Middle Ages. So to be able to be here and be immersed in all the Catholic culture and the and the castles is is a is a great great really fun. Awesome. Well, since we're at eight o'clock, hi Kathleen. It's so great that you agreed to join us this morning and talk about your book. Um, you can see uh, Frances up there. She read it and. She called me and said, we need to use this book in our Aww. ministry. So everyone's quite excited about that idea. And we're also just thrilled to have you coming to us live from the Cather Magdalene country in the south of France. Is that the French Riviera or is that a different no. place? No, this is, a, this is quite a distance from the Riviera. This is much farther west. We are southwest, so in the foothills of the Pyrenees, um, close to the Spanish border. We're about two hours over the Spanish border. Ah, so okay. It's a very it's a it's a very different region than than the Riviera. And um, this was bandit country. This is where all the heretics went to hide when uh, they were being persecuted. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's one of the reasons it has uh, such a fascinating history. And and one of the stories that I wanted to sort of open with, I know that you have questions about the expected one and I'm happy to answer anybody's questions uh, and talk about that book. And actually this is the, this last month was the 26th anniversary of the first time I came here uh, and the event that we started the expected one. Yeah, cause that happened in 1995. So that was, uh, that was the first time I came down here and all these things happened to me that ultimately become things that happened to Maureen. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's part of the talk about in a minute. But um, today, I played, uh, today I went to one of the, cap to, well, this is not a Cather castle, but it's an important cat, uh, castle in Cather history. You all know who the Cathars are? Or do you want me to talk about that a little bit? Well, before we get started on that, because I know we're not going to be able to stop talking about it once we get started. Um, this is our Sunday service, and so I'd like to open with a prayer, and then I would like to um, introduce a little bit, you know, about you and who you are and what you do in your life. So um, is, is anyone uh, chomping at the bit to do our opening prayer this morning? This is what happens, you know, it's, it's like... Um, Usually you can't pry the microphone away from ministers and here we have a group of shy ministers. So I'm going to do the opening prayer. So if everyone would take a deep breath, followed by two more. And as you exhale, just please release any negativity or worries or concerns and know that just for right now, we're going to be in the presence of the almighty one the creator, creatrix. And we're so very grateful for this opportunity to be together this morning to learn more about the world we live in and about the role of the goddess and uh, all the things that happens with her. We're grateful for this opportunity to share with each other. And we go forth in this day with that attitude of gratitude just being grateful for all of it, all the things we get to learn and experience, knowing that as we go through this life, the goddess and the God are always with us. And so we say thank you, Mother, Father, God, for this amazing day. We say thank you for the presence of Kathleen with us this morning.
And we breathe deeply, bringing in that love from our creator and carrying it with us all week long. And so we say thank you, thank you, thank you, Mother, Father, God. And so it is. So it is. So it is. And Jenny, we would like to welcome our brand new minister, Reverend Chris from Colorado. Awesome, that's true. We have um, a, a flock of new ministers to welcome. And um, I've been up at the cabin and as soon as I, um, uh, the holiday is over today, tomorrow I'm gonna get them on the database and do all of the paperwork to, to make all of that real. But we are very, very grateful for our new ministers. So, um, and it's just really special to, have Kathleen. I had to look in a couple of places uh, to find information. So from her website, it says Kathleen McGowan's journey to becoming a foremost expert in the field of women's histories encompasses decades of research and global travel, as well as her own life's initiations. She spent nearly 30 years studying the legends of Mary Magdalene in France and that of the women who have claimed her as their spiritual godmother for over 2000 years. Queens, warriors, scholars, mystics, women who have changed the world, but have been unsung. As the New York Times and global best-selling author of the Magdalene Line trilogy, her books broke foreign language distribution records appearing in 40 plus languages, even while the content was controversial and ahead of its time. So my first exposure to Kathleen was through Ancient Aliens, which I've been a faithful follower of for over 10 years now. And, um, you know, we all, I love the History Channel. I do believe that the History Channel um, got an overdose of testosterone. So um, that, yeah. that makes it kind of difficult. And Kathleen has hung in there in spite of that, and um, she's our agent for change when it comes to that. We had a, a, a short-lived little um, push to write letters to the History Channel and tell them that Kathleen needs her own show because they brought her into the secret of Oak Island um, and lots of others too, I think. There's not just Ancient Aliens and that one, but her research is, is just uh, phenomenal and uh, the things that she's discovered are also phenomenal. Um, she's an Aries, looks like, March 22nd. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, and, and I say that to say that um, fire signs are, are known for their intellect and their ability to uh, do research and they do it well. Our own Cynthia is another one who is just phenomenal at research and we really appreciate her for that reason. So with that said, I'm going to um, turn it over to Kathleen and let her get started talking about if there's anything that you would like for me to share uh, more, then uh, I'm happy to, but I think you could probably fill in some of the, the gaps there and let us know, you know more about you and especially about your books. So oh, please you. help me welcome Kathleen McGowan. Thank you all very much. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here with uh, so many of you who have committed your, yourselves and, and your work to bringing more, more light to the world that we live in. That's for me is why we're all here, right? To, uh, to, to bring more light and to do what Mary Magdalene says in her gospel, which is to bring people to the good, to bring people to the good. She turns their faces to the good. It's one of the things it says in the Magdalene gospel. Um, and it's such a simple word, isn't it? The good, but um, it's so filled with uh, with warmth and emotion and light and positivity. You know, the the Cather people. Going back to what I, what I was starting to talk about, you know, the Cather people. Um, the history and and outsiders gave them different names, called them Cathars. They didn't call themselves that. Call. Um, the, the Catholic people within their own community only referred to each other as good men and good women and brothers and sisters. 
And uh, because again, if if you became a Cathar, you were you were working only toward the good. That was that was the basis of everything that they did. And that came from Mary Magdalene, right? That came from the original teachings, which which were the Magdalene way, turning people toward the good. So I think that um sometimes that that incredibly simple message is uh something that we really need in these very complicated times, you know. So I'm uh, I'm a big I, I'm big on going back to some of these these messages from her that are in her gospel that are so clear. Um, here in Cather Country. So let me ask again: Do you want me to give a little explanation of what Cather Country is, or do you just to let me give you a little bit of history? I write about it in the expected one. So in the expected one, Maureen sort of discovers this. Um, on her journey, and that mirrors what happens to me. I came down to this part of France, knowing from Paris, uh, knowing nothing really about this this part of the world. I knew that I had a um, I had a personal connection to it, in that my great -grand my grandmother's family on my dad's side had come here, uh, had come from here, but they came to America um, during the French Revolution. Uh, they were royalists, and they had to escape France, and that's how they ended up in America. So, although I had a a bloodline connection, a genetic connection to this part of the world. It was, you know, quite a few generations back. So it wasn't anything that I was raised with too much other than I knew that my grandmother's family was roughly from this region and a few other things. Um, and initially I did not come here. Well, I did, I came here in search of Mary Magdalene, but initially I didn't start to write about Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene kind of evolved into my muse during this process. Because what I was doing, my history, my background is I was a journalist. And I had come to the conclusion that I wanted to write about women in history who I felt had been maligned and misunderstood, right? And uh, I had about 15 women on my list that I wanted to, to write. It's basically the book that Maureen writes in The Expected One. Her story is the book that I was writing. Right, so that was the book that I was working on. So I started in Paris and where I was working on Marie Antoinette, right? And then I ended up coming down here to start looking at the legends of Mary Magdalene. Now, why did I do that? At the time, I had no spiritual interest at all. I was raised in a very interesting, eclectic spiritual environment, uh, not Christian. Um, I, my mother was a pagan. My father's family was Christian, but... Um, I was really raised in this very sort of goddess-centric, nature-centric kind of environment. At that time in my life, I believed Christians burn pagans, and that was pretty much my point of view, right? I didn't have any time for the dogma of church. So when a friend of mine came to me in 1993, when I was first starting to work on this project, she said, you've got to put Mary Magdalene in your book. And I said, I'm not writing a religious book. She said, no, 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 you need to, you need to look into her. You need to put her into this book because Mary Magdalene proves your thesis. Mary Magdalene proves your thesis that women were intentionally often misrepresented to disempower them. And that's when she got my attention. And I said, oh, well, this is interesting. And then I started doing the research and realized that it that the church in the, in the 1960s had um, basically come out and said, we made an error in telling the world back in 599 that Mary Magdalene was a fallen woman and a sinner and all of these things. Uh, it's not true. It doesn't say that anywhere in scripture. And the Pope at the time, Pope Gregory V, created this story by conflating the story of Mary Magdalene with the unnamed sinner in Luke's gospel and put them together because he wanted to create an icon of repentance. He wanted to say, if someone as lowly as this sinner could be so redeemed that she would be the first person to whom Jesus appears at the resurrection, then you can be redeemed from anything. So that's how the initial story is started. He basically says this in a homily in 599 as the Pope, and this becomes doctrine, right? Now, that's the generous version of the story. A less generous version of the story is that uh, the Magdalene movement had always been strong uh, in parts of Europe from first century uh, forward, and they needed to begin disempowering this movement, and that this was kind of a propaganda uh, 
exercise, a very powerful one, to start diminishing the importance and the power of Magdalene, right? Um, so for those of you who may not know this piece of the story, following the crucifixion, Mary Magdalene comes to France. And it is here, she comes here with Martha and with Lazarus and with some of the other Marys. Um, and they evangelize the entire Southwest of France. They move into parts of Italy. And this becomes Christian in the first century with Lazarus becoming the first Bishop of Marseille, with Martha becoming essentially the first Bishop of Tarascon and with Magdalene becoming the, essentially the Bishop of Provence. And ultimately, not officially, they were never declared bishops, but they were the spiritual leaders in those places. Um, because at that time, women had apostolic authority, right? In France, it is always referred to as the, apost as the apostolate of Mary Magdalene. She is always referred to as the apostle of the apostles, the teacher of the apostles, and her ministry as an apostolate. So you can see potentially how uh, a, a church that is really what's happening is you have two different churches that are evolving in the first century. You have a church that is created by the, these apostles, so Magdalene, Lazarus, Martha, the Marys, um, who are cousins of the Virgin Mary. One is arguably a sister, we're not sure. Um, we have them settling in France and really uh, evangelizing this thing they call the way, and it's the way of love. And it is faith and charity and everything that Jesus taught and none of the dogma that ultimately comes out of Rome. But what we have that happens in Rome, of course, is we have Peter and Paul and what they are creating there. And I think, um, you know, uh, I don't know if any of you know Kayleen Asbo, I love her, she's so brilliant. And she says something that I just think is so important. She says, it's not that Rome was Christianized, it's that Christianity became Romanized. And I think that's a really important thing to remember about what happens in the evolution of the Catholic Church is that the Romanization begins to happen. And what is, what is Rome about? Rome is about hierarchical authority. Rome is about patriarchal authority. Rome is about, is about power, right? So all of these things that the, this evolving movement is going to have to um, sort of adapt to are these very, um, are really the very things they tried to escape from uh, when, when they left the, the Holy Land in the first place, right? Escaping the Romans. Um, but, Rome, but Rome really becomes the center of uh, what is a power structure, right? So what happens is the church as it evolves in Rome is all about power and economics. And the church that's evolving in France is all about love. It's also all about direct access to the divine direct access. So this is a Gnostic, this is a Gnostic sect of people. These are people who are teaching each other that there should be no go between, between you and God, right? Um, you can have people help you to get there, but ultimately your relationship with the divine is your own. Uh, and you don't have to do penance. You don't have to tithe. You don't have to do any of those things, except as Jesus says, go in your room and shut the door and speak to your God. So you can see how these two things ultimately would, were going to come into conflict eventually, right? And one of the primary reasons for this is the growing power of women as authorities in this early grouping. And we see this in the, in the Gnostic Gospels. We see in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, we see in the Gospel of Philip, we see in these Gospels that were discovered in the, in, in the, the late 19th and early 20th centuries, that Magdalene is over and over again shown as an authority figure, right? She is standing in front of the, the male apostles and, and ministering to them, right? Um, after the crucifixion in the gospel of Mary Magdalene, after the crucifixion, she is standing before the male apostles and the male apostles are all in a frenzy of fear and they're tearing at their clothes and they're saying, what are we gonna do if they did this to him? What are they gonna do to us? And and you know, if we go out there and, and, and preach this way, we're going to all die in the same way that he did. And it's said that Mary calms them down, becomes their, the comforter in chief, really, 
uh, tells them it's okay, it's okay. This is, you know, we're, we're all here for a reason. We're all gonna be okay. We're all, you know, we're here to do this work. Let's just all gather around and gather ourselves and do what he would want us to do uh, and go forward and tell the truth. And that is when it says, one of, one of several times when it says, and Mary turned their hearts and their minds to the good and they went forward as apostles, right? So where all this sort of ends up in France is that this is what evolves into something that is later called Catharism. And it's basically a Magdalene-based Gnostic Christianity. Um, but because there was no hierarchy, Magdalene was never, I would say, from what we understand, she would have never called herself a, a leader. She would always have been, we were sisters and brothers, right? Good men, good women. There would never have been a hierarchy because that was not what they were about. Um, and so what happens in France, particularly also in parts of Italy, specifically Umbria and then Northern Italy around the Alps is Catharism starts to grow. And it starts to grow because more and more women are attracted to it. Of course they are, right? Because they are treated with respect. You know, we have, what, there's, there's some amazing letters that come out of the early church uh, from the early church leader saying things that, you know, uh, women, do you know that you are all Eve and because of you, the son of God had to die? And, and women, do you know that you are no better than bags of excrement? I mean, the things that were being said about women in the early, you know, in the early time by church leaders are horrific. So you can imagine in another environment, so that's coming out of Rome, in another environment where women are being told you are revered because you are a daughter of the Magdalene, um, you know, you are necessary for our spiritual growth. The, the female principle is needed for our spiritual growth. Um, you know, you can see why women would have been a lot more attracted to this. And of course, this was all pagan territory. All the places that Magdalene comes first and all the places that now are known as Magdalene places in France, places where she preached or teached were all formerly goddess temples. So we know that Magdalene was coming to the places of the goddess, right? For example, the hill in Renly Chateau where there is a Magdalene church, that was uh, one of the large, that was I think the largest ISIS temple in, uh, in Western Europe, right? At the, by, around the first, by the first century. Uh, where I am right now, I'm in a little village about five miles from there. And um, I'm right here, right, right across the street from me right now is the ruins of an abbey, but the abbey was built on top of a temple to Artemis. Uh, there was a huge temple to Minerva a few, you know, in a few miles in the other direction. St. Balm, which is the place where she is said to have ultimately settled and lived in a cave, uh, is, was called the Forest of Diana. And uh, there was a, an all-female community that lived at the top of that mountain. So it's not an accident that Magdalene ended up in these places. She knew that she, she, knew that she would find sisterhood there. She knew that she would find women who she could uh, who she could collaborate with and work with, and she knew where she would be welcome. So, you know, we it's really an evolution of from, from the goddess belief system to the Magdalene belief system. And so you can see how all of that, if it's growing stronger, is going to ultimately become or be perceived to be threatening to the church, correct? So, as thing, the other thing that's happening in this part of France specifically is that it, um, it's not France, it's the kingdom of Occitania. So in Occitania, women have uh, basically equal rights. In Occitania, women can inherit. In Occitania, uh, there are a lot of wealthy women. Um, so it's not just, you know, the oldest son here. There's no, uh, there's no primogeniture here. This is really all about Equal, in equality in, in the genders in Occitania. And there are a lot of uh, powerful women. This is where Eleanor of Aquitaine comes from, who I'm sure many of you have read about. Um, you know, one of the most famous and powerful queens to ever, uh, to ever live in Europe. So what begins to happen is that more and more noble women uh, want to enter into the Catholic traditions and ultimately become a uh, what are known as parfaits or perfected ones, which is essentially uh, taking on a ministerial role, right? And committing yourself to teaching the Catholic way. And when they do that, they're bringing more and more money into these communities. 
And that money is then not going to the church. And so there's a lot of things happening by the Middle Ages when the church says, hey, all these people have to be stopped. You know, the, everything they're doing is a threat to us. We are losing money. We are losing people. They are letting women run rampant and all this has to go. So this is what happens. So that the Cathars by the early 1200s are really powerful. Some of the most powerful noble families in, in the Southwest of France and parts of Italy are now either Cathars themselves or supporters. They're all practicing this way of love. They're starting to become a lot more organized um, as communities and the church decides they've had enough. And the Pope in 1209 uh, declares a crusade against the Catholic people. It is the only time in history that a crusade was declared from a Christian against other Christians because the Cathars were definitively Christians. Um, however, they reputed the Old Testament because they did not believe that the God of the Old Testament was the same God as the God of love that Jesus was a part of. So you'll read sometimes historically that the Cathars believed in two gods and there's a lot of talk about their duality. And it's kind of an exaggeration that actually comes from the Inquisition because most material on the Cathars that's in history books comes from the Inquisition. So when, you know, when the people who are persecuting you uh, are writing your history, it's going to always be a little bit skewed. But what they really meant when they said we are, there, this, that God is a different God than our God, is that they just, they, ha they rejected out of hand this idea that any God would do something like say, uh, ask a father to uh, sacrifice his son, something, you know, things like that, that this God was angry and full of jealousy and ag aggressive toward, uh, toward humanity, whereas the God that they believed in, the God that Jesus was a part of and that Mary was a part of, um, is, uh, was a, a, a parental figure, right? Uh, a figure that loved his and her children because it was a mother, father, God for them. Um, so this is where, this is, this is where the, the whole Catholic crusade happens. So around 1209, the, in this area right here, uh, just a few miles from where I am, uh, it was uh, Dominic, St. Dominic, the Dominicans, uh, preaches the first crusade against the Catholic people here and they begin to uh, really just massacre the, the people of this region who, who revered Mary Magdalene. So this is why, when you read about the history of the Cathars, you will often find that the worst atrocities committed against them because it was a genocide, right? Uh, it was an attempt to eradicate an entire culture of people. And the majority of the horrific atrocities occurred on July 22nd because it was the feast day of Mary Magdalene. So it was also the church's way of, of making a statement uh, that they would not allow Magdalene to overtake you know, to overtake their, their spiritual belief system. So um, this happens through from 1209 to 1244. And then in 1244, we have the massacre at Montsegur, which um, is when uh, several hundred Catholic people were, were burned en masse. Um, there had been a lot of mass burnings. That, in fact, the largest mass burnings in history uh, of men and women occurred here during this period. And, um, and then things start to settle down for a little bit and then they, they pick back up again. And so ultimately the, the crusade against the Cathars lasts over a hundred years. It goes from 1209 to 1321, kind of ebbing and flowing in terms of intensity, uh, massacres everywhere. And then it would calm down a bit and then it would depend on who would get into power. And then, and then they would, they would, you know, uh, come back to their, their warlike state uh, against Catharism. So where I was today was the place where the last Cathar, the last Cathar leader um, was burned at the stake in 1321. And it's important because uh, he's a very interesting character. His name was Guillaume Bellebast and he was started out as a, he and his family came from a family of shepherds. Now we always have to look carefully when we find out that someone is a shepherd or a shepherdess in history because that can also mean that they were members of the Cather faith because they were also often referred to as the good shepherds and the good shepherdesses, right? Here we go, the good men and the good women. The Bellabas family was a Cather family. 
And what happens uh, when Guillaume and his brother are in their late teens, uh, they encounter a man who comes to them and tries to blackmail them because he knows their family are Cathars and he threatens to turn them into the Inquisition. And a fight ensues and uh, Guillaume Bellabast accidentally kills this man. Um, he is distraught that he has taken a man's life and he decides he's going to have to flee across the borders into, into Spain and, uh, you know, never, never come back. But he is met on the way by another Cathar leader who finds out about this and follows him and takes him aside. I actually, I took a picture today of what he actually said because I thought it was really kind of amazing. Uh, his name was uh, Philippe de Alirac, and he said, to, he said to Guillaume, you can escape and drag a useless life behind you, or you can follow me and come to the light. And it is said then that Guillaume um, came into their Catholic community. Um, he was forgiven for his sins. Uh, and he made a pledge, he made a vow to dedicate the rest of his life to bringing people to the good and redeeming himself by bringing as many people to the good as he possibly could. And he became very great at it. Uh, and he became a great, uh, a great teacher uh, and a healer and uh, a very, very interesting character, but he's also quite flawed. Um, and I think it's one of the things that makes his story that, that interesting because it really shows you that these people were really, they were ultimately practitioners of forgiveness uh, in a very powerful way that they were able to say to him, you know, you can go across the Pyrenees and escape to Italy and carry this burden with you for the rest of your life, or you can come with us and work through it, right? And, and redeem yourself by, by bringing people into, in, you know, bringing goodness to people and, and, and helping to turn them to the, the good and doing good works. And, and that's what these people were about. This is what they were absolutely about, but they, they could not be governed. They could not be governed by what the church wanted, the tithing, the dogma and that type of thing. And um, that was just always going to become problematic. So I won't uh, go on too much about his story other than to say that ultimately he was betrayed by somebody who was offered uh, significant amounts of money by the church uh, to tell them where he was and um, when he was in hiding and he was arrested, he was condemned in Carcassonne. And in, on, in August of 1321, he uh, was burned at the stake in a, at a castle called Villarouge, which is where I was today. And the reason I was there is because Bellabast uh, proclaimed something when he was going to his death. Um, first, the first thing he said uh, was, um, I have, I am a flawed man. I have I have done bad things, but I have worked the rest of my life to to do good things uh, and to be a part of the good. But God will find me as as I am and as I have been. And um, but then he says something really interesting. He says, uh, "Our time is not now, um, but we'll be back. We will come back in seven hundred years." And in 700 years, the world will be ready for the way of love as we practice it. And the 700th year is this one, 2021. So from 1321 to 2021, we have a 700 year period. So this year is what we call the fulfillment of the Bellabast prophecy, right? And here we are, right? Here we are, and we're all charged, I think, in our ways uh, to turn people to, to the good um, in, in the path of the Magdalene from 2,000 years ago to now. So uh, that's, that's, what, that's where we are today. I need a drink. Super timely that this is also an anniversary coming off of the pandemic, which in my view has really shifted the way people adopt change. So thank you for that. It's amazing. I'm sure. It's fascinating to me that you brought up Eleanor of Aquitaine. Uh, <clears throat> most of us know that um, 
our history classes in school are taught by the football coach or the wrestling <laughs> coach. And I, I don't know how that got started, but it was all about learn, you know, memorizing the dates of what the testosterone people called um, the famous battles. You know, but there was no real history there. So I was always bored out of my mind. And then the movie A Lion in Winter came out. I was living in Panama at the time and I went to see it and I got so excited because I, there were so many things in that movie that were just so phenomenal and that I didn't know. And I couldn't wait to go to the library because this was like 1969. So it was, um, you know, before we had Google and yeah. things like that. So I, I couldn't like do that, but I could not wait to get to the library and learn more about, you know, the history became real to me at that point. So, so, um, you know, that's just, that's really exciting that, uh, you know, and, and while you were talking, it's um, really cool to see the fire burning in your heart when you start talking about these things and, um, you know, how things that happened 700 years ago can affect us today. And I think that that's a, an amazing prophecy that came from them. I love that whole idea that, you know, and, and this is our year for love to come forth. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, time. It took a long time coming, but, you know, if that's the end result of this year, then that's pretty phenomenal. We'll take it. So does anyone um, have questions for Kathleen that they would like? I kind of had a feeling. <laughs> hi, Cynthia. Hi, hi, it's nice to meet you, Kathleen. Um, in, in um, over the years, you know, research expands and um, other investigations open up, you know, um, maybe additional primary sources, that sort of thing. Have you incorporated any of that into later editions of your work? Are you considering other things to um, you know, a new installment, you know, in, in, a, in a different text to um, explore those ideas, anything like that? Yeah, so much has changed. I mean, I couldn't write the expected one today. Uh, yeah. I couldn't. It's, uh, the, the expected one is such a time capsule of where I was at that, in that, at that place in my life. I was 30 years old and, um, you know, I was... All of this was what was happening down here was new to me. So I really wrote Maureen the way that I had felt when I was like Alice in Wonderland, right? I came down here and all of a sudden it's like, I'm through the looking glass. Everything looks different. Um, and also she's everywhere. It's, it's like, wait, this is a whole different world where she's revered and people talk about her openly. And she's, you know, the, you know, the, the unofficial queen of France and, and all of these things. And I'm like, why, how are people not talking about this? What, what is happening here? So, you know, when I wrote the expected one in the, cause I wrote it in the, the late nineties, right? Um, and since then I have spent so much of my life here. I have, I have done 20 more years of research, 25 more years of research um, in so many different places and found so many other amazing sources. Also, my French got better. My ability to research in French got better because so much of the material that really matters about her is in French. Some of it's in Latin. Um, I, you know, was able to meet with other scholars over the years, people who, you know, who could help me with the Latin and even the Greek in some cases, the Coptic in some cases. I just came back from, uh, I've been in Egypt for several months over the last year working on some of the early, uh, early Christian texts that were written in Coptic. So it's been an amazing journey. Um, I would not touch my existing books because I do think that they are important snapshots of, of a particular period of sort of almost innocence in terms of really first experiencing these ideas in a way. And I, I, would, I, don't, I would never want to sort of contaminate that. I think it needs to stand in that place. And I think one of the reasons that the expected one uh, has now been out for 16 years this year. Um, you know, the expected one broke uh, records for foreign languages. I, you know, I still hold the record of the novelist, uh, American novelist for the most foreign languages, um, which is a pretty great thing for the expected one. 
Uh, the actually the only American author in the American female author in more languages than I am now is Hillary Clinton. Uh, and she's not a fiction author. So, um, and, and I don't say that out of ego. I say that because it's not me. This is Magdalene's story. And it's a story that people have um, embraced and have embraced it around the world. I get extraordinary mail from, you know, women in Kuwait, women in Turkey, uh, you know, ex really unusual places, women in the Holy Land. I, I, my books are in Hebrew, my books are in Arabic. Um, so I, that's the thing that one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm most sort of not, it's not a pride thing that I'm most satisfied by is that um, this has been able to bring people together, this story in this way, uh, in a way that um, I don't think other things necessarily have. There's, there's something about the, the way that the story was told that makes it easy for people to follow along, follow, you know, follow along with it and, and be in it. Now, all of that said, um, my research is so far above and beyond what I was doing back in the 1990s that I have literally thousands of pages that I am working through to determine how, how best to use it. So there's a couple of things happening. Um, I have a spiritual book coming out later this year called uh, The Magdalene Way, which is um, uh, about how about her life and her teachings and her approach in France uh, you just basically kind of saved my life. Um, so it's more of a, you know, spiritual lessons, things to learn from, from her approach. It also uses the, um, the, the Magdalene gospel, uh, within it. And so that's kind of a spiritual book that deals with, uh, you know, Magdalene lessons. It's, a uh, inspirational, but then I have a bigger nonfiction, uh, book about my research coming out um, the following year. So uh, I'm just actually now signing that with a publisher and putting that together. Um, so I will have, it's gonna take me another year to just edit all of the material. And it's going to be very focused on who Magdalene is after Jesus. Um, because most of the material that's out there now about her is about her life with Jesus. Uh, and I think that for the 21st century, um, it is her authority as a leader afterwards that is something that I think we really need to be looking at. We need to look at this extraordinary, compassionate leadership that she shows to us in the post-Jesus period. So this is one of the things I'm really focused on in terms of, in terms of my research. Thank you, that is um, really helpful. I had a um, I had a couple of questions here. One is um, uh, I know just enough about publishing to be dangerous, but <laughs> I, I um, have heard that uh, when you publish a book, if people order the book directly from you or your website, then um, you're going to see a lot more of the rewards for that. Is is that um, where, where can we best support you in, in purchasing your books? Oh, thank you. Um, no, uh, well, sometimes that is true. In, in, in some cases, like um, some writers will buy a lot of their own copies and sell them to their website. And, but in, in my case, it's, I, I don't sort of do anything like that. Um, you know, I started my own publishing company last year and uh, I, it's a division of another country uh, company. It's called Asher Press. So it's my own sort of imprint. So the first book, The Magdalene Way, is going to come out through, through that, uh, that company. And I started that company because I want to magnify women's voices and spirituality. So um, it's just, it's still kind of a startup. I'm trying to get it capitalized. I'm hoping that The Magdalene Way will bring in more money to the publishing company. I'm really writing it because I want to raise money to, for that publishing company to capitalize it so I can start publishing other women. So that's kind of my... That's my. That's always been my my dream because big publishing is, is such a difficult thing to to navigate and um, it's so predatory. And I create an environment where women could really be heard, get their voices out there, and not have some gigantic corporation take ninety five percent of their earnings. You know, so that's why I started Astro Press. 
Um, the other book that I'm doing, uh, the the nonfiction, the, the sort of bigger, uh, you know, super serious book I am doing with a lot, not a, not a big publisher. I will not work with, I will not, because my first books were Simon & Schuster. I will not work with Simon & Schuster's and Random Houses. I won't work with corporations anymore. Um, so it's sort of a median uh, publisher that I'm going to be working with on my other book um, because it needs immediate global distribution. So in those cases, the best thing you can do is, I mean, it's the same if you order it from Amazon, if you order it from your local bookstore, uh, it, it's going to be the same either way. Now, the only difference is, um, and I know that, and I, I really, I, I hate to say go to Amazon because there's some things about Amazon that make me upset. But it really does make you know, Amazon subscriptions actually do make a difference. So when books go into pre-order, um, buying them from Amazon in a pre-order does help authors because it puts you higher on the list. And the higher you are on the list, the more attention your book gets. So it's not necessarily money, but it is about um, visibility and status. So I will certainly let you know when things are on pre-order. Um, and if you can pre-order them on Amazon, that's great. But if you prefer to um, to to actually pre-order it through a local bookstore or another bookseller that you're happy with, the most important thing is that the material gets out there. Awesome. Yeah, the that's only good exciting. thing I can think of about uh, you know ordering through Amazon is that that'll give Jeff Bezos enough money to go to space and stay there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not the only person who's been thinking that. <laughs> no, you're you're in a, a good crowd this morning. So, I Nikki, I'm it. sorry, did I interrupt you? No, it's okay. I just wanted to make a comment saying, oh, we definitely want to support you and your books and the, the new information coming out, really exciting times. And I wonder, was part of your visit to the castle because you have events coming up around this uh, 700 year anniversary this year? I do um, actually, and also I'm leading groups in France as a res because of this. So I've actually got a, a group coming next week. Um, I have a group coming to France in September. Uh, I am doing a Magdalene conference the first week of December in uh, California, in Ventura. Ah. Um, so the, well, there will be something online. I don't know what it's going to be yet. Um, I've just been so excited to, to see people again. And yeah. <laughs> with humans um, so I have been planning events now that I can um, Wonderful. so there will be uh, if you are uh, happy to travel we have we're going to be in France and in, in California uh, if you prefer to do things online there will be something I just don't know what it's going to be it'll probably and it will probably happen November December because I'll need some time to put it together wonderful well we'd love to support you and we have a public blog if you feel so inclined to just keep Oh, up. that's amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Does anyone else have questions for Kathleen? I have a question. Hi, Kathleen. I'm Randy, Jenny's husband. And I was Hi, wondering, Andy. of all the places you, you traveled all around the world, you kind of hinted at some of your favorites. Do you actually have a favorite place that you've visited and, and done research? Uh, I right where I'm sitting right now, I think is uh, it, this, this part of France is is owns me. It has my it has my heart and my my soul in its in its uh, in its sway. I absolutely adore it. Uh, second, the second place is uh, Abydos in Egypt. Um, I I love Egypt. I am very profoundly affected by. Uh, the Egyptian mysteries, but Abydos specifically, um, because it is such a powerful, it's so ancient, uh, you know, the Osirian temple behind the temple of Abydos is so ancient that they don't even know how ancient it is. I mean, there's, there's speculation that it could be 50,000 years old. Uh, and the legendary site of the healing of Osiris, this is where Isis healed Osiris in history. Uh, it's also the original location of the flower of life symbol. The first version of the flower of life symbol was found engraved on the, the walls of Abydos. And it's just, uh, it's probably in terms of, of sheer spiritual power, I think Abydos is the most powerful place I've ever been. Um, so that's a place where I go when I just, when I really need to, to you know, some deep, deep spiritual work. 
Um, also, my late husband, my late my husband Philip passed away in December of 2012, and he was um, he was a, a real Osiris guy. In fact, uh, when he was sick and we checked into the hospital, and I was doing his paperwork, and it got to religion, I said, "Honey, what do you want me to write?" And he said, "Write Egyptian Hermeticism." And I said, <laughs> "Okay, <laughs> I don't know if they're that." And uh, I did because he was Egyptian and uh, really in his heart. And he was Belgian actually, but in his heart he was Egyptian. And um, so I initially went to, after he died, um, we, were, we were on our way actually to Egypt together for the December 21st, 2012 event that we were both participating in, in Egypt when he got sick. And he had a very, it was very shocking. He had a very fast acting cancer and he died very quickly. Uh, in a few weeks, so at the age of 41. So from diagnosis to death, it was only 14 days. It was oh my God. really heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. So um, Abydos became a place for me, uh, ultimately, because it was the place of the healing of Osiris, that I, I, that I needed to do some, some things and have some closure. So this January was the eighth anniversary of his death and burial. So I was able to spend that in Abydos and uh, in the temple there with a lot of help from the Egyptian people who supported me and, and just, it, it was, it was, it was profound. And it just, it really, I really feel like it, it, it helps. It's helped move me into this sort of next phase of my life now, you know, um, that I just felt like I, I was able to really sort of embrace this, this ISIS element because there's a huge ISIS element in the Magdalene movement, right? There's so much that connects ISIS and her sister as well, Nephthys to Magdalene, and that's part of the research that I'm doing uh, in Egypt, is where do, how, how these traditions connect, because certainly we're talking about the enormous, right? Isis and Nephthys as the, as the sort of original anoint, anointers, right? Uh, also, their, the importance of women in all of the resurrection stories, right? Uh, Osiris is resurrected because of the work of Isis and Nephthys. Uh, Magdalene is the common denominator in the resurrection stories in, in the New Testament. So there's, I'm, I've been doing a lot of work around that, both spiritually and, and uh, in terms of research, you know, mental research and historical research on this idea of women and resurrection and what that, what that really means. Anyone else have questions for Kathleen? I just wanted to. I just wanted to say that I've been reading your book, the um, expected one for days, and I feel like I'm in a time warp or something. And um, I've been really enjoying it. And I don't think I've, I've I've learned so much. I've been looking up the paintings, and it's been amazing. I've, I just wanted to thank you for your writing and uh, introducing me to this. Um, I think where I'm supposed to be right now. So I, I just appreciate you for, for that. And I was wondering, is there any, uh, is there a web page or something that I can, you know, so I know where you, where you are and what you're doing? And Yeah, if you go to my, uh, if you go to KathleenMcGowan.com, there is a place where you can sign up for um, my, uh, my newsletter, my mailing list. Um, I'm pretty active on Facebook, if you are Facebook people. Um, but uh, my mailing list is, is where you're going to get all the, you know, the okay. And you were referring to the um, Magdalene Gospel, and I'm wondering, um, I've read the Magdalene Gospel, at least the one I think I've read. It's, a, it's the one that was, uh, there's missing parts in it, but it's the one that says she was the one that calmed the apostles down. Is there something different or is there something more that I don't know about? Um, well, there's a lot of different pieces. There are, there are a number of, of Gnostic Gospels where she is mentioned. So um, there's, a, there's a book, actually, there's a book that there's a there's a wonderful, wonderful amazing friend, uh, an author uh, a researcher, his name is Jean Yves, and it's L E, capital L O U P, and he did uh, he translated the Coptic from the French, and then the French into English with the, with some help, and he does all of the Gnostic material, but he has one specifically that I think would be good for you. And I'm looking it up because I can't remember what it's called. Uh, I think it's called The Sacred Embrace, where he combines the Gospel of Mary Magdalene and the Gospel of Philip to show you uh, a lot more about, it gives you a clearer picture of who Magdalene was. Let me just double check it. 
Thank you. Uh, it should be required reading who cares about these subjects. His work is fantastic. Uh, it's called uh, The Sacred Embrace of Two. I would say get the sacred embrace of Jesus and Mary, the sexual mystery at the heart of Christian tradition. And the paperback's eight, so cheap. Um, and then uh, the Gospel of Philip, uh, the Gospel of Philip, and the subtitle is Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and the Gnosis of Sacred Union. And you can get both of those books for 20 bucks. So I would recommend both of those um, because uh, he really he really shows you sort of how to tie together some of this material, um, and it's gorgeous. Thank you so much. Appreciate sure. it. Could you speak to the goddess work and sort of that connection to Magdalene in the goddess? In terms temple? of the Egyptian, the Egyptian goddesses? Uh, or... That's a great start, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's always been a, from the very first time I arrived here, I was kind of thrown into this understanding that, uh, especially down here in France, there's, there's, a, there's a strong Egyptian, um, there's a strong, it, it, it's an amazing location because for the last 2000 years, there has been pretty much every kind of belief system practiced here, right? It's been a, a real interfaith community. There are places, um, I used to live in a place about 20 miles from here um, where it was, the house was a thousand years old. It had been built during the Cathar era and it had built, it had cut into the side of the wall this, um, this symbol that is so gorgeous. And it was an interfaith symbol of uh, the Kabbalah, Catharism and Sufism. And that's because in the middle ages, all of those, uh, those, they had mystery schools here as well as communities and they all worked together at a time where that wasn't happening anywhere else. But in addition to that, what you had here was you had a really expansive goddess world, goddess community uh, of independent, powerful women from the even the from you know the second century BC, um, all the way across the Mediterranean, right? So a lot of I was actually a few weeks ago I was in Spain in Catalonia because there's this whole region that it was settled by the Greeks, right? So there's temples to Hygieia and temples to uh, Hygieia and Asclepius as healers. There's um, there's uh, all kinds of Artemis temples up and down. Artemis was very, very uh, revered here. In the square in the town where I live, there's a, there's a statue in the middle of the square and in, in a fountain. And she's this amazing combination of Artemis and Athena. And that is because there were temples to both of those women here. So this represents the, this represents the goddess in all these different aspects, right? And then there's, and the front of the, of the fountain has Medusa on it, right? And then just down and down the river, I'm on this extraordinary river that um, is known for its pure water, uh, and it's called the Ode, A-U-D-E, in the Ode region. Um, and there is a statue of a river goddess here, and her name was um, Alexa or Alethea, uh, and ultimately that means the chosen. Uh, and she was so they they called this the chosen place of the goddess. And uh, the name of this town, it means the, the chosen place um, of the waters. So there's, there, this region is full of extraordinary um, goddess traditions. So in terms of Magdalene, we know that she came to these places. There's, a, there's so much wonderful local folklore here. And that's why this is the kind of research that I've done. And you know what, it, listen, it's, been a, it, it's, it's a great job. I'm so blessed to be able to be the one who gets to do this. Um, because the research I do for the most part, excuse me, is as much in these villages as it is in books. Now I've found some extraordinary documentation and, and, and primary and secondary sources, but I will tell you the most interesting stuff comes from being here and hearing just these amazing stories and, you know, hearing the stories of people up on the mountain about digging in their garden and finding little uh, Egyptian artifacts and finding uh, little Osiris statues and because they know that it was an Isis temple up there, right? So we know that she came to these places for a reason. At the foot of that mountain where uh, the Isis temple was, 
there's a there's a place where the rivers cross and it's called Les Labadou, uh, which is like the laundry or the washing place because it's where the women from the region would gather. They would all gather, they would do their laundry and have their sort of you know communion there. And the legend is that Magdalene was a part of that community. She came into that community and she ministered among them. Um, so, you know, she was very definitely connected to uh, these goddess traditions. And the other thing that's important is we see like um, one of the Cathar castles, the castle at Montsegur, which is probably one of the most famous ones, is part of an ancient castle that is aligned toward the summer solstice. So we have a lot, there's a lot of, of certainly natural, if not pagan traditions that were involved with Catharism as well. They did not come in and the difference between um, this Magdalene centric Christianity and what happened in Rome is that they weren't proselytizing here. They weren't out to convert anybody. If you wanted to join them, you were welcome. But if you weren't, that's okay too. Like they weren't out because it wasn't about power. It was about, it was about love and being in community with the people that you love. And it's like that here now. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm here so much because communities here are just magical. Um, but, you know, and of course in Rome, we had, you know, you have this dogmatic need to convert people and, and to control the way that they think and believe uh, and, and to control essentially the way that they live their lives. Um, but uh, Magdalene wasn't doing that because she was really following the path of the goddess in, in so many ways, right? She is the feminine principle. But um, one of the things that's interesting is that her feast day uh, is July the 22nd. And that was something that was given to her uh, by the early, early church, probably by, we believe there's not, it's, it's not documented where it came from. It looks like it came from the Coptic people, which would make sense because July 22nd was also um, a feast of Isis because it was also the feast of the flooding of the Nile. So it's when the Nile floods, it's when the star Sirius is closest to the earth. Uh, it was a festival of Isis and then it became a festival of Magdalene. So we also see this place where Magdalene and Isis become kind of intertwined, yeah. right? Um, Isis anoints her husband in preparation for his resurrection. Magdalene anoints Jesus in preparation for his resurrection. Uh, Isis is, uh, Isis immaculately conceives uh, Horus. And, you know, so there's the whole, the very first immaculate conception, uh, conception in terms of story, legend, mythology or history is Isis conceiving Horus, right? And then later, of course, we have we have Mary conceiving Jesus in an immaculate way, which there's a, that's a whole, I could do a two hour lecture on that um, because <laughs> it's different things. If you've read my books, you know that. Because <laughs> 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 I talk about that a lot in the book of love. But um, so there's, I think having spent a lot of time in the Holy Land, uh, in the area around Galilee, also seeing that the flower of life is found in Magdala, where it's also found in Egypt. Uh, in Galilee, there's a lot of Egyptian tradition. There are mosaics from the second century in Galilee that show uh, when the flooding of the Nile happens. There's so much connecting uh, Egypt and Galilee. There's so much connecting Egyptian traditions to what was, was happening uh, with the first century. Certainly the Christians, you know, Egypt has, uh, all of this tradition of the Holy Family being there and, and Jesus being there, and they're very proud of it. Um, and it's really fascinating to go to some of these places and they say, yeah, of course, Jesus knew this. He was here and he was here and, you know. Um, so I think, I wouldn't go so far as to say, there are a lot of people who say, well, Magdalene was an ISIS priestess. I don't think I would go that far personally. I, don't, I haven't, seen enough evidence in my in my experience to say that but i will say the traditions of isis and osiris um are all over the story of magdalene and jesus in a very influential way all right this is so amazing we are so appreciative of you coming i want to honor your time and um make sure that I know that you are busy and have some other things that you need to go attend to. W one last comment. Um, one of the things that uh, the people that I love listening to the most is Freddie Silva. And the reason I love listening to Freddie Silva is because 
Um, I've heard him say that what he does and how he does his research is that he goes to the place and he talks and communes with the locals. And that's how he comes up with some of the most amazing connections because he, he takes the language. And since I haven't read your books yet, but that's on my list. So, um, you know, but, <laughs> I know, right. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I watch you on TV, so that I, I'll have to go with that for now, but, um, anyway, Freddie. Oh, and by the way, thank you for, uh, supporting me on the history channel. That has been, a that's been a big, uh, it's, it's, it's been, it's, it's been a lot of chipping away at the glass ceiling. Let me, let me tell you that. I can imagine, you know, it's like, I see it, I see it happen. I see that, you know, they call you in for like Oak Island and, you know, and, and what those two brothers went to France to chase down something and, and they had all of your knowledge at hand and they turned and looked somewhere else. It's like, okay, guys, what are you thinking here? You know, so, so anyway, we might uh, be able to get behind and uh, behind you and start another letter writing campaign that you need your own show. And that would, uh, that would be amazing because we're actually talking to them right now. So, oh, um, good. Okay. Well, but, to to them. let's have some off camera time and we'll talk about, um, you can maybe throw some tips my way on how you would best like to see that happen. And then, you know, I can do a little work to, to help support that effort. So I think that's really wonderful. And also I would encourage everyone to go to Kathleen's site, sign up for her emails and stuff, and you'll, you'll get an opportunity to know when she's taking groups to different places and, um, you know, put that on your bucket list because I'm sure that would just be phenomenal. And, you know, it, we're so thankful that um, you joined us this morning and uh, helped us understand some of the things. Does anyone else have any other comments or anything before we close out and say goodbye? I just wanted to thank you, Kathleen, for your years and years of incredible research, bringing Magdalene's story to us and um, the story of the, the Cathars and the Coptic and, um, and the connections. Um, our ministry being one that works so closely with the divine feminine, this has been so inspirational and, and educational for all of us. And I, um, I've read all your books now. I can't put them down. <laughs> you are an amazing author and storyteller. And um, I feel so honored to be able to sit here and just listen to you talk about all that you know. So namaste. Um, and, uh, Kelly, keep so it up. <laughs> thank you thank you so much and I, i'm you know if you end up with with questions let me know you can either ask them through jenny or later on we can do this again in a few months if you've got if you now after once you start reading you're going to have more questions mm -hmm. hey i got your number now girl i will be uh, i will definitely be contacting you to say okay and we had talked um briefly about maybe doing a uh an online seminar that uh you know people could attend where you can, you know, share more about your books and especially the trilogy or, you know, wh whichever you prefer. So we'll talk some more about that as Wait, well. I to say because they're all ministers is I don't know how many of you know that I wrote a book about prayer that is not a fiction book it's called oh. The Source of Miracles. Uh, oh. And about the, because the Cathars, the only, the only liturgy the Cathars had was the Lord's Prayer. That's the only thing that they actually used because they believed it was the only thing. It, it is the only place when the, where Jesus says, this is how to pray. So they, uh, prayer solely, but they used it as a very interactive prayer practice. Um, and so I wrote this book, The Source of Miracles, to break down how the Cathars used uh, the Lord's Prayer as a, as a prayer practice. Oh, wow. I find that interesting. That's really great. Yeah, I got uh, a copy. You yeah. know, I'm kind of uh, OCD about stuff. That's one reason why if I start a book, it doesn't get laid down until um, it absolutely has to. And usually it's after I finished it. So once I start something, so that's, I have to like 
okay, what else do I have on my calendar right now before I pick up a book? And I'm a Michener fan. So, you know, I like the long meaty <laughs> ones with, you know, he does a lot of research. I mean, it's like, yeah, so, but I know that I get OCD about reading. So I have to like pull back a little bit. Well, thank you so, so much again for joining us. We look forward to the next time. And I'm gonna ask Francis to do our closing prayer. And, um, and then we'll say goodbye for now and meet up again next, next week. And you're always welcome to join us anytime you want, Kathleen. Oh, thank you so much. That's great. We would love to have you. Oh, thank you. That's really, uh, yeah, that would actually, that would be wonderful, especially when I'm in your same time zone. <laughs> Well, thank you again for joining yeah. us. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I uh, you know, I've had your book. I've had, well, I've had the expected one. And I know that it's, uh, you know, it, you're much farther than that now. Um, I've had it for about six years. I finally picked it up and I'm like, oh my God, we got to use this book. <laughs> so, and, um, and we've also, Nikki, I don't remember if we have, if we've started a list of books on our website, but we'll definitely be adding your books to it. And um, I'm just, yes, grateful, very grateful that, that you were able to join us today mm -hmm. and that you're interested in joining us in the future. And I just can't wait for your, um, your spiritual book to come out. Um, so yes, thank you. All right, so if everybody wants to um, close their eyes, breathe in through your nose as deep as you can, and then release through your mouth. Do that three times. Mother, Father, God, we are grateful for Kathleen's presence and her, her sharing of, of her knowledge and her research through her books that have now, that have now come to us. And um, the, the love and forgiveness theme is something that, that we will carry forward. And we, uh, we pray now for healing for ourselves, for our families, for our communities, for the world. And if you want to speak the names of the people that you know need healing, speak them now. Fred. You may have made yourselves. <laughs> Fred. Joan. Michael Lovely. and Junior, Ernie Martinez, Sean, Mindy, Shani, Martinez, Andy, Paula, Yvonne, Lori, Marianne, Gina, his, his brother, Sunday. Shirley, for all those names that have been spoken and unspoken, and for those that have no one to pray for them. We ask healing for, for all of those as well. Thank you, and so be it. So be it. Thanks, Kathleen. Thank you all so, so much. It was wonderful to <coughs> you all. Thank I'll be you. Able to see you again. <laughs> yes, right. thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.